So just by way of quick definition, and this is taken from the website of the Basic Income Earth Network, it used to be the Basic Income European Network, but they recently changed their name and expanded their focus. It's an unconditional income granted by a political community, a, a state or government, to all of its members in an amount that meets basic needs. Now, we can have all kinds of discussions about what that amount in monetary terms is, but that's the definition. A radically different compared to our current social assistance and other income security schemes, there's no means test, no work requirement. As we were talking about this morning, the idea behind it is paid to individuals rather than to, to families. It's paid at, the, uh, at a level that's regardless, or paid at the same level regardless of place of residence. Uh, this has been an interesting discussion in, in Europe where they've talked about this, where um, in many places, or in, often you hear the argument, well, it's more expensive to live in Paris or London than Brussels than it is to live in a rural area. But part of the idea, at least as it's advanced by Von Paris, about basic income is it gives people real choice, real liberty, real freedom, so you can choose where you want to live. And finally, at the highest sustainable level, fiscally and uh, programmatically sustainable within a given political community. Now, in fact, we've had a, a few, uh, it, it's an old concept, it goes back to well, Thomas More and his colleague uh, Vives in the, the 1500s. Uh, uh, th that was kind of the, the, the notion of, of uh, universal support for the poor, which led to the Elizabethan poor laws in Britain, among other developments. In, in the time of the French Revolution, uh, Thomas Paine talked about it as, as kind of a stake in society that should accrue to all citizens. Now they hadn't figured out the, the, the women part of it at that point, but at least the principle was established. And even Charles Fourier in, in the mid-1800s in his uh, utopian socialist scheme. Now we actually have an existing program, and believe it or not, of all places, Alaska, the Alaska Permanent Fund, which is, I think, a, a kind of rough prototype, at least, of basic income. Of course, uh, Alaska earns all kinds of resource revenues, and it's designated in state legislation going back to the early 80s that uh, every citizen in Alaska uh, gets a piece of the resource revenues from oil and gas. And in fact, they're mailing out the checks next week and it works out to about $1,000 per person for, for the yearly dividend that accrues to all people in Alaska. There's other, uh, now that the, the programs in France and Portugal are more related to labor market insertion, but there is attention paid to social inclusion going beyond the labor market and providing for kind of a minimum income level for, for all people in certainly France and Portugal. Italy has a scheme as well. Uh, it's not, the, the experiments are not restricted to wealthy countries in Brazil. There's a, a minimum income for school attendance. Now it's targeted, it's not pure basic income, it's targeted to poor families. But if uh, poor families have young children that should be going to school, provided that the child does go to school, they get a minimum income. And this, among other things, prevents families from having, um, being under pressure to put their, their, their uh, children to work in the paid labor market. South Africa is talking about moving towards some kind of a a basic income scheme. Now, there's financial challenges there, obviously, in terms of being a developing country. Uh, I, I don't have it on the slide, but actually, uh, there's a strong commitment of a coalition in Namibia, and they're talking actively with the government of putting in place a basic income scheme. Now, it would, wouldn't be a subsistence level. It's a poor country. It would be considerably lower. But uh, Carl Weiderquist from the U.S. says that if we could get half of Bill Gates' money and put it in a permanent endowment, There'd be, we'd have enough for a basic income scheme for all people in Namibia. So that's something interesting to think about. I think a real uh, advantage to the basic income model is it allows us to broaden our definition of work 
to recognize and compensate various forms of socially necessary and useful work outside the labor force. Now, this includes, of course, uh, the work that mostly women still do in, in the home and, and raising children. Uh, it also includes, I think, what people might contribute to their communities in, in terms of voluntary service, community activism, uh, protecting the environment, etc. One thing that kind of surprised me a bit in the, in the focus groups we've run so far in Saskatchewan is uh, people, at least the people we're talking to, haven't bought into the, the targeting uh, discourse, the targeting mentality. There's still a very strong attachment to universality, even beyond just Medicare, as important as that is. And also a, a notion, and of course, uh, this was talked about this morning by, by Sheila, uh, that, that economic security, that living with dignity and choices amongst life is a human rights issue. It should be nationally, and it is codified to some extent internationally. Of course, concern about the cost. Can we afford it? Um, I think it's important in this regard to contextualize the debate and, and think about basic income implementation in terms of broader reforms to the tax system and and perhaps cost savings on welfare policing. As, as Randy mentioned this morning, uh, uh, the government doesn't have to uh, need to know who I'm sleeping with before I apply for some kind of financial assistance. I think there's a, a strong environmental, ecological argument for basic income, that we need BI or something like it to, uh, to green our social welfare regime, so to speak. The Keynesian welfare state, of course, was founded on economic growth, um, you know, a, a growing economy that would support more and more full-time paid jobs that would support people, and the, the welfare system just kind of kicked in on specific ways to supplement it. Um, we don't have that luxury anymore in terms of the environmental crises we're facing, and we have to think less about economic growth and much more about economic redistribution, both nationally and internationally. And of course, political will. Um, of course, we face particular challenges in provinces like this one, where even the right to strike is under attack, uh, the right to collective bargaining. Uh, but on the broader economic front, uh, even in nominally social democratic uh, provinces like Saskatchewan, um, the, the neoliberal discourse is strongly entrenched with politicians, both provincially and federally. I did my PhD on welfare reform in Alberta, I'm sorry to say, um, and I looked at the impact of welfare to work policies on welfare recipients uh, with preschool children and I followed them for a year. It was a qualitative study and I was looking at how welfare to work policies impacted their health, well-being, childcare arrangements and ultimately employment and income outcomes. And what I found uh, I found a lot of different things. I'm just going to focus in on a couple of things right now. But very generally, um, what really surprised me and threw me, actually, for about um, two years, was that welfare recipients liked welfare to work. And that was something that I really didn't understand because I had conceptualized this study within a citizenship framework where I argued that we had moved from a model of some sense of social rights, although prob problematic, to a sense of this idea of market citizenship, where you only matter as a citizen if you're attached to the labor market. So within that conceptualization, I did not expect welfare recipients to like welfare to work. But they did. They saw welfare to work as their ticket out of poverty. It was going to give them skills, it was going to give them a job, it was going to give them uh, money, and it was going to give them social inclusion within a, a very uh, right-wing environment. Um, of course, because I had the chance to follow them for a year, I learned part two, and part two was what happened um, with many of the wel welfare recipients. The reality was that most of them did not gain meaningful labor market attachment. They, uh, some of them did get jobs, but they were what we all know about part-time, precarious, low-paying, dead-end, bad jobs. Um, not all of them were able to get jobs because of other factors. Child care didn't match with the realities of the labor market, some of them had health problems, and so on and so forth. So it didn't work the way they had hoped, and in the end they were left 
um, angry and disillusioned. But the surprise finding that they liked welfare to work really caused me to reflect on some things that I hadn't caught, uh, thought about before. And I think it, may, it gave me a bit of a more nuanced perspective on um, what needs to happen in my ideal. Um, prior to that, I was very much focused on we need to have good social assistance. Uh, it needs to be adequate and it needs to be destigmatized. And I still think all those things, but what I realized is that I was also being somewhat paternalistic in thinking that if we just do that, um, welfare recipients will have adequate income and that will be fine. What I, also, what, I, what I learned from this is that they want some of the things that I want and perhaps you want and so on, and that is that they want to have some sort of sense of engagement with their community. They want to be, they also want to, a lot of them wanted to be engaged in paid employment. And who was I to say that didn't matter, that we just needed to focus on basic um, income support. So. I started to think about this a little bit differently, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, one of the central issues, I think, when looking at welfare state, states and how we conceptualize need is this notion of agency and structure, which is so key to social science. Uh, when does need entitle people to make a claim against the collective? That's really what we're talking about. And there are different orientations to that. Um, I ask a secondary question here, which I think to people in this room is an, uh, has an obvious answer, but I'm not sure it does to uh, politicians uh, at, at this point in history. And that is, is income redistribution a moral responsibility or morally problematic for society? Now, I raise this for a couple of reasons. First of all, as Monique Bajen mentioned yesterday, and I was very pleased about, we need to get back to talking about values. What is it as a society we care about? I think we've lost that. We're so focused on pragmatic solutions and um, what's um, economically sustainable. We've stopped talking about values. What's the right thing to do? So I'm suggesting we need to reintroduce a moral argument into this debate. Secondly, um, I got thinking about this idea of morally problematic um, because there was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago where a U.S. economist is quoted, uh, named Dan Mitchell, um, very associated with the Republicans, as you might imagine. Um, and he said that income redistribution is morally problematic because it punishes economic success. <laughs> so that's, uh, it put me in a rage, to be honest. Um, but when I started thinking about that, I thought, you know, is that not an underlying assumption of some of the policy directions that we've gotten into now. That it's not our responsibility to redistribute income, it's people's, individuals' responsibility to work in a very narrowly defined sense, as in paid employment. So I just think we need to ask that question again. What is it that we want in our society? Um, what, kind of, um, what kind of society do we want to have? Let's reintroduce the moral argument into that and let's have a debate about it so we get it up front. Because I think it's there, we just don't talk about it in that way. Now related to that is the problem of need. And Anne Robertson from the University of Toronto wrote a really brilliant paper called The Politics of Need. And she argues that when we're talking about need in the, wel in the welfare state, uh, we need to really rethink about how we understand need. She argues that Need, the, the, the discourse of need, has been dominated by two discourses, and they're both individualistic. The first one is the therapeutic discourse, and it focuses on individual deficits and renders everyone, all of us, as potential clients. Something wrong with us, we need fixing. That's problematic. The second discourse, the rights discourse, she also argues as problematic. She says that it is good for making claims against the collective, um, but it is an impoverished way of expressing the need for the collective. So although it talks about um, the individual's rights, which is, is not bad in itself, it doesn't talk about the claims that we, that the needs that we have for the collective. So she proposes a third approach, which she calls the moral economy of in interdependence. And here she suggests that we really need to get back to the mutuality of relationships. Uh, Robertson states, our very individuality exists only as a result 
of our embeddedness in a network of relationships, both private and public. None of us is totally independent of our context, social, political, and economic. Rather, we are located and live within complex webs of mutual dependence or interdependence. So individuals need one another, and they need the collective. There's a sense of interconnection. So um, in thinking about this, I was thinking a lot about the agency structure uh, debate and this notion of need. And I wanted to come up with some sort of analogy that would help to explain this to myself. And I'm a cross-country skier. And um, I've, I like to ski in very cold weather. And I'm always amazed every time I do that that I'm not cold. I feel warm. I feel safe even though I'm out in the middle of nowhere in very frigid conditions. And uh, so the way I see this, um, agency and structure can be looked at like weather. In a good winter, which to me is cold with lots of snow, from Edmonton, um, is like a social structure. It offers us many constraints and um, problems, but it also offers us opportunities as long as we have the resources to engage in those opportunities. So the individual is able to overcome the constraints to engage in opportunities, but only with considerable resources. So using the, the weather analogy, as a cross-country skier, if I have good equipment, if I have a Gore-Tex coat, um, if I have um, nutrition, uh, lots of good food and nutrition to keep me warm when I'm out there, if I have a warm house to return to, and so on and so on, then I can take advantage of those opportunities despite the constraints of the cold weather. I can still get out there and do, and do my thing. But I need to have the resources. And similarly, um, individuals within our society can engage in some of the things society has to offer, but not without considerable resources. So that's where the Gore-Tex approach comes in. It recognizes that social investment and um, building people up and investing in them to be able to engage in society is not a bad thing in itself. But first we need a layer of social protection. So it's a layered approach where first we have protection on the one hand, and then on the other hand we have um, other investments that help us to engage in the society. And this fits within this notion of the moral economy of interdependence. It realizes that we're connected, that we need each other. It recognizes the messy connections between paid work and unpaid work, between caring work and employment, um, between work and family, and so on and so forth. And although the citizen's basic income is not a new idea, it merits revisiting to enhance the current investment policy orientation, which on its own excludes many marginalized women. Thank you.